we were looking at the effect of uh, current mismatch in the charge pump when the upper and lower currents are mismatched. What happens is that when up and down switches are simultaneously on, you get the mismatch current into the charge pump. Now, to compensate for this, there has to be a phase difference between the reference and feedback signals in steady state, so that the average current through the charge pump is 0. Okay. So, <coughs> In the case where the upper current is higher than the lower current, uh, you find that reference lacks the feedback signal. So, up will be low, down will go high first and both will be on for a duration of T reset. Okay. So, the current into the charge pump consists of these pulses equal to I C P for a duration equal to the phase lag and minus I C P in this case and equal to delta I that is the current mismatch for a duration equal to T reset. Okay. if that is delta phi I C P times delta phi uh, times T ref by 2 pi that is the duration that is the charge in the negative pulse should be equal to delta I times T reset. Okay. <coughs> so, this delta phi increases as delta I increases the current mismatch increases or <coughs> the reset delay increases. Okay. So, you get uh, a pulse train like this, this is the current I C P that goes into the charge pump. Okay, and this is the control voltage which feeds the VCO, right? Now, what is the effect of this? Yeah. So what happens is this ICP goes through R and C, and you get some uh, uh, control voltage waveform which is also periodic at FRF. So this is now. Uh, which also leads to a periodic control voltage at F ref. Okay. Now, you can see in case of the CDR, the input frequency was equal to the data rate. So, that equivalent reference frequency there is very, very high, right? whereas here uh, it can be a lot lower. So, now this will modulate the VCO. Okay. Now, when a periodic uh, signal modulates a VCO, what do you get in the spectrum? First of all, what is the spectrum of this signal? If you have a periodic signal, what is the spectrum of this? Qualitatively, what is the spectrum? What do you expect? Huh? Okay, what will be the impulse at the DC value? Yeah, what is that? Zero. So there is no DC uh, here. Okay, and then this is T ref, right? This interval is T ref. Side. It will be periodic at 1 over T ref that is for sure, and but it will not have a DC component because the average is 0. And if you do want to calculate the spectrum, I will not do that here. First of all, you can notice that if you integrate this, what will you get? You will get a pulse like that, 
and then it will come back to 0, because the positive area and the negative area are the same. Actually, in this case, uh, it will be negative and then uh, it will be like that. Okay. Now, you can compute the integral of this and calculate this area. Okay. So, let us say it is some a epsilon, right? then this will be this can be approximated as an impulse strain, right? because I mean you have these narrow pulses with a certain area. So, that can be approximated as an impulse strain for calculating the spectrum. Okay. So, this calculation you can easily do all you have to do is find out the area a epsilon under the pulse. Okay. Now, it has a non zero width, you approximate it as an impulse, which means that uh, in the real case the spectrum will fall off after some frequency. If you approximate it as an impulse strain, the impulse strain will have the same amplitude uh, in the frequency domain, the impulses will have the same amplitude for all frequencies, right. What is the spectrum? Uh, what is the spectrum of this? What is the spectrum of an impulse strain? This is T ref, right. What is the Fourier transform of this? Impulse strain is fine, but what is the? No, it is not a sign. Yeah, so it is basically 1 over T ref delta of f minus n f f, okay. n s minus infinity to infinity. So, this you can consult a standard textbook like Haken or Lathe or something, you will see that, okay. And also, I mean, there will be some differences depending on whether the Fourier transform is expressed as a uh, function of uh, the free cyclic frequency f or radiant frequency omega and so on. There will be some 2 pi that may come up, but this is the correct one for the cyclic frequency f. So, this will be a epsilon by T ref. Okay. <coughs> it just has scaling of a epsilon that is all. Given that what will be the spectrum of ICP? You know the Fourier transform of the integral of ICP. Okay. So, what is the Fourier transform of ICP? Huh? Which is 1 by j omega. I want I have the Fourier transform of this, the integral of ICP. I want the Fourier transform of ICP. So, what should I do? Yeah. So, it is just j 2 pi f times this, right. So, this will be j 2 pi f a epsilon by T ref. Okay. Is this fine? Now, you can see that uh, the component for n equals 0 goes away, because it is getting multiplied by 0 here. Okay. And if you take it inside, basically you will get, I mean 
you need to know the value of f only at the locations of the spectrum right so okay this is okay so i don't want to calculate the spectrum and so on you can calculate it uh, essentially what happens is this is uh, this will go through an rc filter to give you the control voltage so you can calculate the spectrum of that right in steady state it will just be so this will be what If you have the spectrum of ICP, how do you get the spectrum of? I, uh, if you have the Fourier transform of ICP, how do you get the Fourier transform of the control voltage? Yeah, R plus uh, one over. Yeah, I'll keep everything in F times this whole thing. Okay. So the bottom line is the control voltage will also be some uh, periodic uh, waveform. And that will modulate the uh, that will modulate the uh, carrier. Okay, that will modulate the VCO. Okay. I'll just show it qualitatively, but you can calculate it. Control voltage spectrum will be something like it will not have DC but it will have some components f ref or if i put it as uh, f by f ref it will have components at integer multiples of f ref okay and what will be the spectrum and the output of the vco the output of the VCO should give you a line spectrum, single line at n times f ref. But uh, what does it give you? Huh? Yeah. So what will happen is that uh, the spectrum of the VCO again you have to calculate this right because. Uh, so, let us say you have cos 2 pi the output frequency is supposed to be n times f ref t plus you will have some phi of t this is because of uh, the periodic variation in the control voltage and I will take one particular Fourier component of this. Okay, I will say that this is uh, some phi k cos 2 pi k f ref t. Okay, I am taking basically the component at k f ref it has uh, the phase will have components at f ref 2 f ref and so on right integer multiples of f ref I am taking one particular component. By the way you have to calculate it properly because this is V control and V control to phi the phase of the V C O what is the relationship. Yeah, 2 by KVCO by S. Yeah, so it's basically KVCO by J times F. S is J 2 pi F, right? So it's KVCO by JF times this whole thing. Okay. So there is some calculation involved, but you can calculate it. I won't go into that one. I mean, the expressions are messy. So phi will also be an impulse strain in the frequency domain that means that it is some periodic signal okay so it will have components at f ref to f ref and so on the value at dc will be zero this is okay so if i take this particular uh, component what will i get now it's assumed that this phi k is small okay so you can see that this can be first of all expanded as cos 2 pi n f ref t 
and you get a multiple cos phi of t right cos a cos b minus sin a sin b but cos phi of t i will approximate it as 1 because phi is small okay and sin of this times sin of that one okay sin a sin b Okay. Now, this sin phi of t itself is approximated as sorry sin phi of t itself is approximated as phi of t. Okay. So, this extra stuff that we get is sin 2 pi n f ref times t times uh, phi k cos 2 pi k f ref times t right this is okay so what will this give you what will be the spectrum of that what will it have i mean the control voltage has an impulsive component at kf ref let's say so, what will be the spectrum output spectrum of the VCO? Yeah, so it will have the sum and difference uh, stuff, right? It will have basically components at n plus k and n minus k, it will have side bands. So, first of all, you will have the component at n f ref that corresponds to this one that is the main component right and this phi k should be small. So, you will have components at n plus k times f ref and also n minus k times f ref. Okay. So, this these things correspond to this quantity. Okay. Now, I have taken it <coughs> for a particular value of k is okay. So, this is the spectrum of the VCO. I am not showing the 0 or maybe I will show it broken here. So, this is the spectrum of the VCO. It will have whatever it is supposed to have. It will have a it should have uh, an impulsive component at n times f ref approximately plus these okay this is fine now of course if i add in values for different values of k so i'll have <coughs> so in addition to the periodic component at n times f ref which you wanted to synthesize you will have side bands at integer multiples of f ref okay this is okay because i mean the control voltage doesn't have just one particular sinusoid it will have many sinusoids and all of them will modulate the vco huh? which part oh the right side okay we don't have a remote so Okay, okay, I will keep away from the margins. So, this phenomenon this is known as uh, these are known as spurious components basically, they are known as reference spurs. Okay. So, these also uh, constitute deviations from periodic uh, nature of the output. The output should be periodic at n times f ref. What is the period of the output, the actual period of the output? Huh? What is it? 
Yeah, it will be the TREF itself. The phase lock loop also, the output is periodic only at the reference frequency, not at n times FREF. Okay, but of course, the component, the output is such that the component at n times FREF is very strong and all the others are weak. In fact, all the others should ideally be 0, but that is not the case. Okay, so this is a problem and this happens because of uh, uh, charge pump mismatch. These give you what are known as this uh, phenomenon is known as reference feed through. Okay, that is the reference modulates the VCO. That is the reference feed through. Uh, in the PLL, it happens because you have charge from current mismatch plus reset delay, and this essentially gives you reference spurs. This is side bands of the VCO at integer multiples of FRF. Now, one of the specifications of the VCO is you have the main tone at n times FRF, the ratio of the strength of that tone to the largest spurious component that you see. So, that has to be. Uh, more than some value, that ratio has to be more than some value. Okay, is this fine? Now uh, you would like to minimize this as much as uh, possible, right? What is it that we can do? Is the problem clear? First of all, so the, because you have charge from mismatch, the two will uh, lock slightly out of phase, and you will have periodic modulation of the control voltage which gives you uh, reference parts which is uh, periodic components uh, modulating the uh, VCO signal. Okay. So, in the spectral domain you can see this very easily if you plug in the output of a PLL on a spectrum analyzer you will see not only the main tone at the main synthesized tone at n times FRF, but a uh, number of tones uh, which are separated by integer multiples of FRF okay. and you want to minimize these. So, what is it that you can do? Huh? You have to filter V control. Okay. Now, yesterday I mentioned that you have to be a little careful while introducing filtering in the loop because of uh, stability concerns, but I also mentioned that if you look at the magnitude of the loop gain in the system that we have now, the loop gain is like this. Okay. This is omega u loop and that is the 0. Now, where is the reference frequency on this axis? It has to be, it will be, I mean 10 times is for modeling, but it is going to be somewhere here for sure. Okay, It will be well beyond the unity loop gain frequency and it is not uh, uncommon to find reference frequency to be, uh, let us say even 50 or 100 times the uh, unity loop gain frequency. Okay, That is just so that you can uh, filter out the reference data. So, if you look at omega ref that will be somewhere over there. Okay. So, now you have to do something in the loop let us say to filter out this, but you should not affect stability. So, what is it that you will do? Yeah, how? What will I do? I mean, this is the loop gain uh, uh, body plot, right? So, on the body plot, tell me what is it that you will do? Pole and 0 where? What is your solution? Yeah, so basically, uh, stability <coughs> for stability, if you add things here, right, beyond omega u loop, it does not matter. I mean, it does not matter, meaning if just after omega u loop you had a pole of course it matters but i'm saying like a uh, little bit far away from omega u loop if you have another pole it doesn't matter okay so basically you have to introduce a pole somewhere between the unity loop gain frequency and the reference frequency of course it has to be between because it has to filter out the component at the reference frequency right uh, because uh, the 
control voltage, the charge pump current has components at FRF to FRF and so on. Okay. So, to filter out the component at FRF, you have to have a pole before FRF. Okay. And sometimes you can even introduce more than one pole. So, let us say I will show it as two poles. Okay. So, while doing this you have to of course, reevaluate the stability criteria and see it will affect the phase margin to some extent. So, you have to make sure that the effect of all of that is negligible or within acceptable limits and so on, but this is one thing that you can do. You have to ensure that the phase margin is sufficient. Okay. So, what this uh, these extra poles do is attenuate the uh, component at omega ref and its uh, higher integer multiples and reduce the amplitude of uh, the voltage that is modulating the VCO. Okay. Is this fine? So, how would you do that here? So, the transfer function from ICP to V control is R plus 1 by SC now, you need to have extra poles. So, what will you do? A one standard thing that is done is in fact, this is almost never used for a PLL and in fact, this anyway it will always have some parasitic capacitor even if you do not want it because the control port of the VCO will have some parasitic capacitor. So, anyway what you do is you introduce a capacitor C 2. Okay. So, you can see that the high frequency components of I C P will go into C 2 and will get filtered out. The problem with this uh, I mean having only this forget the parasitic capacitor is that this I C P goes through R and creates a voltage that is proportional to R whereas, here you have only a capacitive path. So, the amplitude is reduced substantially. Okay. Now, sometimes you can uh, you may need to go further than that. So, introduce a second capacitor, then maybe you need like another filter before you go to the VCO. Okay. So, this gives you one extra pole, this gives you two extra poles okay. and you can go further also. You can have one more extra pole by having one more RC section. right? You could even
that is the control volt ok. It is possible. So, this gives you three extra poles that is fine. Now, you have to be a little careful with these other things which give you lots of extra poles. As far as attenuation is concerned right attenuation of the reference component you should keep all these poles as close to each other as possible then you will get the maximum attenuation right. If you look at this basically uh, if these two poles were close I mean if two poles were on top of each other you would get a higher attenuation, but in these you get the extra poles if you try to put it on top of the first extra pole what happens is the value of R 3 and C 3 R 3 becomes very large and C 3 becomes very small you can calculate and find out. Then the noise from R 3 becomes very large ok because R 3 is very large. So, you have to be when you go to these extra poles you have to be very careful that uh, you are attenuating the reference feed through, but you should not add a lot of extra random noise ok. So, if you choose if you choose the component such that the noise from this and that are comparable, then the poles will be far apart ok. You understand you cannot put poles on top of each other and get a lot of attenuation. Now, if the poles are far apart and you should get some benefit from them the ratio of reference frequency to bandwidth should be very large ok. So, let us say it is 100 times maybe you will be have room to place maybe a couple of poles if it is 1000 times maybe like a few more, but uh, otherwise if it is small let us say it is only 20 times it is not likely that you will be able to have these extra poles. I mean you can, but by having very large values of R 3 and so on, but this will be a problem because then you will add up uh, end up with a lot of noise ok. So, to be careful of that. Now, one thing I want uh, discuss explicitly here is what we want is a loop filter ok and this is the standard technique uh, that is you have a charge pump and you have a passive loop filter. If you have a passive loop filter you will have sort of low noise I mean especially for a simple structure like this, but sometimes people do use active loop filters you can use an off amp and in that case you have lot more freedom in pole placement right. It is not in a passive RC network what is the constraint on the poles of a passive RC network. If I have only R and C, what kind of poles can I produce in the network? You know this, right? What's that? No, no, not necessarily. But uh, that depends on the values of R and C. But there are some types of poles that you simply cannot produce without throwing also an inductor. I will give you any number of R's and C's, and you can connect it any which way you want. But there is still a constraint on the kind of poles you can have. You cannot have complex conjugate poles, you can only have real poles right, whereas with active circuits you could potentially have uh, uh, complex conjugate poles which is what gives you like very steep attenuation and so on. So, that is there, but I would not discuss that uh, you can put any, but the disadvantage with uh, active uh, filter is that you will have an op amp let us say and the op amp will have noise extra noise compared to this. So, it can be more noisy, but sometimes people can uh, people do use active loop filters. The same goes for the CDR also ok, but this is the simplest structure right especially this part of it ok. In a CDR you are looking for rapid corrections to the phase right. So, that is why essentially this is what you uh, realize and you will have some you have to live with some parasitic capacitance and just like you did in the assignment you just make sure that the parasitic capacitance is small enough or you have to adjust the values of this to be the impedance of this to be low enough ok. In a PLL invariably you will not uh, make a PLL uh, frequency synthesizer with only R and C typically you will have at least C 2 this is free right this is like free attenuation of the reference feed through and the goal here is to get a periodic signal not really to track the reference data ok. If that is the case then maybe you will lose, you may use a structure more like a CDR, but this is what it is ok. This becomes I mean you cannot do anything to the reference feed through once it is there once the uh, control voltage modulates the VCO you cannot do anything because the reference frequency can be quite small ok. So, this distance this spacing here right 
it is quite small. This is not something you can remove using another filter or something like that, that is not possible. The reference frequency is very large, possibly you can do that, otherwise you cannot do anything about it. Okay? This is one more reason why if you somehow manage to have a higher reference frequency and a smaller value of n, it is better. Okay? You will see that even from reference uh, feed through calculations, because you can see everywhere you have integrals. right? From ICP to uh, the control voltage, there is an integral relationship. From control voltage to the phase, there is an integral relationship. And what does the integral do? It emphasizes low frequencies and de emphasizes high frequencies. So, if you had a very high reference frequency, it would be better. Okay. Any questions about this? This is pretty much about the charge pump PLL. Now, one last note is this reference feed through what we have calculated is if we have our system model with the, we have our three state phase frequency detector and the reference feed through that comes because of uh, the inherent nature of the phase frequency detector. We have to have reset delay for it to work and that will uh, and we will have always have mismatch. So, because of that there will be a skew and so on. Now, you can also have reference feed through like uh, let us say you <coughs> if you do the layout in a where is the so, let us say you build this and then you do the layout in a dumb way. So, maybe the reference line is coming from here and it is going like that to connect to this point. I mean, there will be a coupling between these okay, that will directly modulate the control voltage and give you this. So, the control voltage has to be protected from all kinds of external interferences from supply and so on. Okay. So, those are practical things that is not something we can discuss here until we actually get to the layout stage. But you should shield the control line from all disturbances. Okay, there is no point. Let's say trying to minimize uh, reset delay, all of these things. You put three extra poles and so on, and have a reference frequency line coming like this. Okay, or you could also have. Uh, sometimes what is done is <coughs> these capacitors can be quite large. What was the value of the capacitor you found in the CDR assignment? And picofarads in the 100 picofarad range, this capacitor, right? The zero capacitor can be quite large. Now, in a PLL, the reference frequency is much smaller, so the zero frequency is also much smaller. And in a low noise VCO, this cap can be easily like many nanofarads. Okay, so that means it will be outside. Actually, many PLL chips that you see, you will have. Now the option it depends a little bit. So, you could have the basically the control node as a pin and you have the entire low filter outside. Okay. Sometimes a part of C 2 is inside also. The reason is that this ground and the chip on the ground on the chip are not exactly the same. right? They are connected through bond wires and things like that. So, you would like basically if you have a VCO and you have its control voltage and I will assume that the VCO responds to the difference between the control node and ground, then the VCO will have its own ground. So, you will have some C 2 inside. So, this will hold the voltage very well. right? So, that is why you will have some C 2 inside. Okay, I do not know maybe in analog ACs you have seen this. Like you connect these bypass capacitors, you know what are bypass capacitors, right? So, they are basically there to hold the voltage constant, even if you have some disturbances coupling in from elsewhere. But you have to be careful about connecting them. Okay. For instance, I mean, I am diverting a little bit from the main topic, but let us say I just have current mirrors. Okay. I have something like this and then I suspect that some disturbance may couple to these nodes. Okay. Now, in general any AC disturbance coupling to some node, you can mitigate the effect by connecting a large capacitor from that node to the incremental ground. So, where should I connect the capacitor here for the let us say node 1, where should I connect the cap? So, between here and ground. 
what about here at node 2? I mean, if this was being supplied by an ideal supply, whether you connect it to ground or VDD, it is the same thing. But obviously, this is a dumb thing to do because now this is holding this voltage constant with respect to ground. So, if you have any variations in the power supply, that will appear directly, directly as VGS variation. This will in fact modulate the VGS and the current through the transistor. So, this bypass cap has to be connected to VDD. Similarly, in case of the VCO, depending on the actual construction, whether you use PMOS, what kind of varactor you use, whether it is on the top or bottom or anything. So, you have to see first of all is the varactor responding to the difference between the control node voltage and ground or control node voltage and VDD. So, that C 2 and the loop filter should be connected accordingly, right. It should be connected so that uh, it otherwise what happens is now you are actually making the system more susceptible to noise from VDD. So, let us say the VCO is responding to the difference between VDD and the control node. Okay. In fact, if I have a VCO like this, if this is VDD and I have the varactors and this is the control node voltage, we know that the capacitance depends on the DC bias across the varactors. What is the DC bias across the varactors here? And let us say I have uh, my structures with the current source on the bottom, okay. not a very neat figure, but anyway you get the idea. So, what is the DC bias across the control uh, across the varactors? It is V D D minus V control. In fact, here that C 2 you should connect it, you should not connect it between here and ground. If you do, what happens is so it will start responding to V D D changes. Okay, you should connect it between this and V D D. So, these are like very practical things, but what I was saying is also that there is no point like doing a very nice uh, P L L design where T reset is small and you introduce like three poles to get rid of the reference feed through and then let us say you have an external one and then you choose the reference pin to be right next to this. Okay, the reference comes from outside, right? From crystal oscillator. This is like a, okay. This is an extraordinarily dumb thing to do. But uh, what I'm saying is, like, uh, bad things can happen because of the higher level layout issues and so on. So if you choose the reference pin next to this, clearly these two bond wires will be coupling to each other, and you are basically making, almost deliberately making the reference modulate the control voltage. Okay. Now, in general, this is again general knowledge, not particular to VCO. If you want two signals not to couple to each other through bond wires, the best thing is they should be at right angles to each other. You know that uh, the mutual inductance between parallel lines is maximum between right angles ideally it is 0 if it is in. So, if you do have it like this, then probably if you can, you should have the reference in the other direction. So, that uh, does not couple to this. Okay. Which angle? No, I think you are talking about the. So, whether a single line on a PCB, whether it should have the sharp corner or it should have something like this. Yeah. So, this is different. The sharp corner, especially with some high voltage and high frequencies, it can radiate and things like that. So, that is why you do not want sharp corners. Okay. So, you will have rounded corners and also sometimes with very sharp corners, there can be mechanical uh, issues. That is this thing this 90 degree angle the trace can probably lift up more easily when it is heated or something compared to something that is rounded. Ideally, maybe if possible you cannot fabricate these things easily, but it should be continuous and rounded. Okay. So, that is a different thing altogether here I am talking about two different lines which are magnetically coupling to each other okay. because you have a chip uh, I think in analog AC design you may have seen the picture you will have a die inside and you have the package outside. This is the silicon die okay. and you will have pads on this and they will get connected to pads on the package and the package itself may have pins. I mean depending on the package, the pins may come out or may be folded inwards and things like that. right? And this is not far off from scale. It is possible that is only a millimeter wide and this is 5 millimeters. So, actually this bond wires will be a few millimeters. Okay. 
Now, you can see that even if you did not intend to let us say this is v 1 and this is v 2, this is like having mutual inductance right between these two. So, they will talk to each other. Now, the mutual inductance value is also small it will be in the nano Henry's, but uh, the point is the higher the frequency you go to the bigger this will be a problem. So, in general like if you want two things to absolutely not talk to each other you have to keep them as far away as possible and preferably at right angles to each other. I mean you do not usually have I mean you do not have arbitrary freedom in this right you cannot choose like a huge package unnecessarily and things like that, but uh, as much as possible you have to do this also. Anyway the point I was making related to the PLL is that reference feed through I have discussed one phenomenon where V control gets modulated by the periodic uh, charge pump current. But you should also have to make sure when you make a PLL that it does not get modulated by anything else, also, right? Is it okay?